with the encouragement of his wife, Kadija, a prosperous trader who was also his employer, he begins to preach and makes countless converts to the new monothe monotheistic religion. He respects Christianity and Judaism, referring to their adherents as the people of the book. He is opposed by a traditional leaders in Mecca. Years of strife follow. The Prophet, with 70 Muslim in 622, the Prophet with 70 Muslim families migrates from Mecca to Medina. This migration, or hijra, is considered to be the beginning of the Muslim era. The peace treaty in 628 between Mecca and Medina. 632, the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Abu Bakr becomes the first caliph. Within two years, he has united the tribes of Arabia. Under the caliph, Umar, Muslims invade Iraq, Syria, Egypt. 638, the conquest of Jerusalem, the third holiest city for Muslims after Mecca and Medina. By this time, the Persian Empire in 641 uh, is defeated and Muslim control of its territories uh, begin. 644, under the third caliph, Uthman, Muslims conquer Cyprus, Tripoli, North Africa, and establish rule in Iran, Afghanistan, and Sindh in Pakistan. 656, the assassination of Uthman. Strife follows, which leads to the rift between Sunnis and Shiites, about which we hear quite a lot today. And in 6. 61, the murder of Caliph Ali. 657, the, um, the Umayyad dynasty is founded. And 705, under Caliph al-Walid, al the conquest of North Africa continues, and the Muslim Umayyad kingdom is established in Spain. Well, since the uh, since Arabia uh, was inhabited largely by um, l largely uh, by nomadic people, uh, there was no tradition of architecture, and so the Muslims, as they conquered land or were invited uh, to new places, they made use of, they, they employed the building methods and of the people they conquered to construct mosques and shrines. A perfect example erected in 685 is the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, a fine work of architecture with a beautiful domed rotunda expressing Islamic aspirations in an adopted style. It was not a mosque, but a shrine vener venerating, venerating a sacred place. We should note that it was sacred to Christians, Jews, and Muslims. At its center, you will make out the rock where the prophet Abraham offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice to God, and also from which Muhammad ascended on the night journey to paradise. We need to remember that Muslims regarded both Abraham and Jesus as prophets. The designer's model for the, for the Dome of the Rock was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, built by the last Christian, the, sorry, the first Christian Emperor Constantine in 335, on the site of both the crucifixion and the tomb of Jesus. You will notice the circle of columns defining the central space and supporting the dome. This church remains one of the icons of early Christian architecture, still standing and visited by vast numbers of pilgrims. And this aerial view shows that, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, 
shows the Dome of the Rock up on the Temple Mount, and then down below uh, is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and then this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, where apparently there was a fire a couple of days uh, ago. You may uh, get an idea of the, uh, of the wall uh, of the Dome of the Rock covered with blue tiles. Uh, that was added in the, fifth, in the 16th century by the architect I'll be talking about a lot, Mimar Sinan. The adoption of architectural forms from conquered societies is only an early stage in the history of Islamic architecture. As you will see, architects working in the service of Islam developed unique forms. They acquired an advanced understanding of engineering and employed it creatively to build in an original manner. But let's go back to the very first place that could have been considered a mosque. Uh, this is the house uh, of Muhammad in Medina. This prototype for early mosques that followed consisted of a courtyard 56 meters long, really quite big, with his, where his followers prayed. On one side, the roof supported on posts gave shelter from the sun uh, for a few. On another side, nine small rooms provided domestic accommodation for the prophet. It said that the prophet stood on the trunk of a palm tree to read the prayers, to lead the prayers. Several centuries later, the majority of mosques considered, consisted of a large domed prayer hall. But like the House of Muhammad, the early mosques in North Africa and Syria spread out horizontally. As we will see, small domes are added, but they have little impact on interior space. The mosque was the natural expression of a theocratic society. It required no specific type of structure or space. The prophet stated, anywhere you pray, that place is a mosque. However, mosques required certain features, which I will enumerate. So I'll skip this list of all of them, because I will come to them one by one. The first necessity was a spacious prayer hall where many worshippers sheltered from sun and rain could pray with an axis leading directly towards Mexa, Mecca. Far in the distance you may make out the niche in the distant wall on that important axis and that niche is known as the mirab, an absolute essential in a mosque. It's on the side of the mosque facing Mecca, which is known as the Qibla wall. The axis through the mirab is the Qibla, ax Qibla axis. There were such beautifully ornamented architectural devices, the prayers were directed to Mecca. To respond to the requirement Muslims became experts in surveying. Imagine trying to figure out the direction of Mecca in a desert. And then another requirement is the minbar, a pulpit for Friday prayers. It usually stands to the right of the mirab. This example uh, of a minbar is in the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, where I was fortunate enough to visit before the horrifying war began. Next is the minaret, a tower from which the Buezin calls the faithful to prayer. They take many forms. Most include an interior spiral staircase and one or more galleries. These are in Isfahan and Istanbul. But some of the early large mosques, the minarets were quite monumental. The one at Karuan in Tunisia rises in a square tower in three stages, topped by a small bow dome. 
The spiral minaret at Samarra in Iraq is virtually unique. The slim vertical one in Mardin, Turkey, takes a more traditional shape. It looks over the headwaters of the Euphrates River. When I was there, I wished I could climb to the upper gallery to see even further. And then there's a need for water for ablutions. This provides the essential purification before prayers. Sometimes a row of brass taps projecting from a wall proved sufficient, but this necessity was often the excuse for an attractive architectural feature, often in the, small, in the form of a small domed pavilion. The ablutions fountain offered a social space for men to chat before prayers, even as they submit to icy water on cold days. From requirements, I moved to a significant prohibition. The representation of humans and animals uh, was forbidden. In these two images, it's easy to see the difference between the Christian depiction of holy figures such as the Virgin and Child by Giovanni Bellini in Venice on the left and the Qibla wall uh, of an Istanbul mosque on the right. The white calligraphy on the blue tiles of the Sokolo Mehmet Pasha mosque in Istanbul is not only beautiful but conveys lines from the Quran. Abstract design based on plant forms adds to the richness uh, and you will also see that in the dome uh, of the same mosque. The lack of sculpture and tombs in mosques allows a sense of spaciousness. I compare the openness of Rustem Pasha's mosque in Istanbul on the right with the extreme example, Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey, London, where the tombs of poets are erected by their passionate admirers. They attract more sightseers uh, today sometimes than the architecture of the cathedral. And so um, I compare that with the uncluttered space of the Rustem Pasha Mosque in Istanbul. The second characteristic, uh, oh no, now I get to some characteristics. The first one is structural ordering. As you look at that plan, uh, you can see uh, that there's an underlying, a rigorous underlying geometry. The next is structural daring and innovation that reaches astonishing heights in many mosques. Here you see uh, the dome over the Mirab in Cordoba, Spain, and the dome of the Shezada Mosque in Istanbul, uh, which you saw the plan of a moment ago. The third is the use of domes, absent in early mosques, then small and gradually growing dominant. Well, when we talk about domes, we'd better go back to their origin. On the left, you can see a pantheon in Rome, a monolithic structure uh, with only one opening, the oculus in the crown of the dome. And the walls are 10 feet thick, and the light only enters in that one place. The next one is Hagia Sophia, uh, the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, built by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian, to, is in, in a much more dynamic structure. Its walls and the ring of windows under the dome penetrated by light in many places. And this light shone on the mosaic surfaces inside the dome and on the walls. And finally, the Selimiye Mosque in Edirne, Turkey, showing the high point of the architect Sinan's achievement in the marriage of structure, space, and light. And then innovative elements uh, in 
uh, Islamic architecture include, wait a minute, I've got a little lost, ah, include the Mukarnas, uh, the fascinating way of making a transition uh, from a square to a round shape or uh, where an upper level projects. Uh, this it goes beyond necess structural necessity uh, to give an intriguing elaboration. And next, uh, oh, surface ornament. Uh, which we will come across in uh, many places, often including calligraphy. In many mosques, we will see reused Roman columns. In the mosque at Cordoba, uh, which has about, oh, 400 columns, they're all from Roman buildings uh, in the city that was conquered. Uh, by the Umayyads uh, and uh, not all the same size, not all the same material as porphyry, granite, uh, marble, all kinds of surfaces, but the space is so uh, amazing that we don't notice those de details. And then there's also polychrome masonry. You see the arches here. You might have noticed them in the Dome of the Rock to one feature that appears in some countries, not in others, is the avan, which is a recess in a flat wall. Uh, top for example is in Isfahan, um, and uh, then there's one of a madrasa, a theological school in Turkey, and bottom right, a house. I'll just make a little comparison between Roman and Islamic approaches. In the Roman on the left, a portico, column portico, stands forward from the colonnade beside it, emphasizing uh, an entrance or something important, whereas the Ivan is a recess. And then a very common feature uh, is the use of courtyards. Uh, which you see in, in many, many buildings. Beautifully uh, attractive spaces. Now, I'm, I think I will point to places on the map. You all know where Iran and uh, Tripoli are. So here are some examples of some early mosques uh, in North Africa and the Middle East. And I'd be pretty well moving eastwards rather than going chronologically. The Great Mosque at Simara in Iraq from 848 to 852 was built in the time of the Abbasid, Abbasid Empire. If you look at the plan, uh, you'll see a dotted line uh, going um, across it, which is the Qibla axis. The dark spot on the right is the minaret, an extraordinary feature with a spiraling structure. And unlike most other minarets, you can see that uh, this mosque is a ruin. And I believe that some extra damage was uh, occurred during the recent war. One of the be most beautiful early mosques from the late 9th century is the Great Mosque of Karawan in Tunisia. Uh, you can see that there's a huge courtyard with a long prayer hall beyond it. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. this view shows that there is both an immensely tall three-staged minaret and then there's a small dome over the entrance to the prayer hall. And domes like this uh, were almost uh, incidental. Uh, what you see is the, the great long space. And there's just a little emphasis from a dome over one bay of the structure uh, added later. 
Here's another view. Uh, you saw the prayer hall before. Here's another view. And again, you'll notice reused Roman columns. Corinthian capitals uh, were not part of the later Islamic vocabulary. Yeah, I, that's the one I'm talking about. I was just talking about. I planned to go to Cairo before this lecture, but I had to postpone that trip. Uh, so uh, I'll cut this short to two mosques. The Mosque of Ibn Tulun in Cairo, 876. The dominant a structure in the middle of the courtyard is actually for ablutions, but it's really celebrated by a dome uh, and by the striking exterior uh, form. But the materials are relatively plain. Are the, co the colors of the desert, another view of it, and the plan. Next is the mosque of Al-Hazar in Cairo, 970 to 72. Again, a very long prayer hall with, which makes me as a, an architect wonder about its stability. Uh, look at those heavy arched walls above these slender columns. It's lucky it's not an earthquake zone, though I can see that struts have been uh, added to give it a bit more stability. In Cairo, minarets vary greatly. These ones uh, have quite elaborate galleries and end in what looks like a tiny onion dome. So there's that uh, interior uh, space. I think I didn't show you the picture of it while I was talking about it, but we'll move on. One of the most wonderful uh, early mosques uh, built in 706, which is not very long after the death of the prophet, is the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus uh, in Syria. The plan shows a huge courtyard to one side, which occupies more than half of the space and then the long um, mosque. Uh, and where, where this heavier structure uh, appears is a small dome. But you can enter and move through the mosque and barely notice that there is a dome. It hasn't sort of taken over to covering the entire space. So there's a view looking up into it. And it's a bit like an early Christian church with its slender arcades, uh, in this case, two-tiered arcades, not very different from the, the early Christian churches in Rome. On the left, you have a drawing of St. Paul's outside the walls in Rome. And above uh, these delicate second tier arches, two to each one of those below. Uh, I was very lucky to visit this before the war. And this, you've already seen, uh, uh, the, shows the mirab and the minbar, uh, the pulpit of that mosque. Well, now we're going to take a, make a move uh, to Spain at the other end uh, of the Mediterranean. This is a portrait of Ab Abd al-Rahman, who lived from seven, uh, 731 to 788. His life story is absolutely amazing. He was the son of the royal family uh, of Umayyad, Baghdad. They were overcome by the Abbasids who drove them out 
And while a massacre was going on, Abd al-Rahman managed to escape from the palace um, and soon he came uh, to a river uh, and dived into the river uh, to swim across it. His brother was with him who didn't swim so well. Uh, the attackers, the invaders shouted, don't worry, come back, we won't harm you. And the younger brother who wasn't a good swimmer turned back. Abd al-Rahman went on, the younger brother was slaughtered and Abd al-Rahman soggy from swimming across the river, no doubt, uh, escaped and found uh, friends who could conceal him. Uh, he made a long uh, journey from Baghdad to Egypt and east, sorry, west uh, along the shores of the Mediterranean through Egypt and Tunisia. And gradually people recognized uh, his ancestry. There were Umayyads uh, around who could support him. And over the course of about 10 years, he built up uh, an army and gained support enough to cross the Straits of Gibraltar uh, and go to Spain, where some Umayyads uh, were in power, but he managed to take over uh, uh, as the ruler, as the Umayyad ruler, ruler of Spain. And he embarked on a program of building, creating a scholarly society uh, which gave precedence to business and architecture over war. And his dynasty endured for 300 years and he built the great mosque uh, of Cordoba. Have, have any of you been there? Ah, oh, yeah, quite a few. Um, here is a plan of it. Only a small part was built by Abd al-Rahman. That is the part that is shown in a lilac color, but followers built la larger areas um, down to the bottom right and left where Abd al-Rahman III built more. And then in the 16th century, after Christians had conquered Cordoba, they built a cathedral in the middle, uh, which you can see standing up here. As one critic said, what a tragedy to destroy part of one of the most beautiful buildings in the world to put up a third-rate Gothic cathedral. <laughs> so this is the unforgettable part of it. Once again, you can see reused Roman columns, hundreds of them, but they weren't long enough to give a lofty ceiling. And so they built arches on top. The lower arch is a horseshoe arch. Uh, the other one goes up higher uh, and they're in this polychrome uh, masonry, which creates a dazzling effect of red and white going off into the distance. I always feel that when I look at this picture that it just goes to the horizon. So there's an example of structural ingenuity. The mirab is a compartment uh, which uh, you can see just uh, is here and in front of it is a compartment which has a dome which I'll show you in a minute and then there are these cusped arches giving uh, an incredible uh, um, structural freedom. The dome over the mirab uh, which you see here in two views was begun in 833, so that's a, uh, a bit later. And while we're still in Spain, there on the right, you will see the Giralda Tower, which was the minaret uh, of a mosque in Seville, uh, replaced by the cathedral. And it's interesting to note uh, that many uh, Spanish bell towers of mosques 
of, of churches are actually minarets. They were nearly always square, very large, very tall. The Giralda Tower is the tallest. Oh, I hadn't shown it to you. Sometimes I see the picture on the right of my screen. So this is the Giralda uh, Tower next to the more recent Seville Cathedral. And now I come to the Alhambra Palace in Granada, Spain, mostly built between the 13th and 14th century. It is both a fortress and a palace. You, you see uh, here uh, the walls of a hilltop fortress built over a long period of time uh, with incredible spaces inside it. I've always wondered where on earth uh, the Umayyad, con sorry, the, the, the conquerors, not Umayyad, my mind's got lost, um, the conquerors who were fierce people managed to end up with this delicate architecture. I've searched and searched for any information on the origin of this kind of architecture uh, at the Alhambra. There's absolutely no documentation, but it seems uh, that many of the architectural ideas come from palaces in uh, the Middle East, uh, for example, uh, Baghdad, which have disappeared. All its uh, forerunners have disappeared completely, and so we just don't know how they uh, how these ideas, where these ideas originated. And no doubt, some craftsmen migrated from the Middle East, but then there were also uh, Byzantine craftsmen uh, around the Mediterranean. So, this is a really unforgettable, but I'm sure a lot of you, who's been there? Quite a few. I was unfortunately there on a gray day. Uh, but uh, we'll never forget uh, the experience, the court of the lions, uh, pretty much at the center of the palace, has one of the few examples of representation of animals in Islamic architecture. This is a palace that really speaks for Islam. It's full of inscriptions about Islam, but it also obviously is designed for pleasure. As we move forward, you can get closer to the lions. You see the very, very tall pointed arches uh, that, uh, and walls above them that seem to be carved away as if they were lace. And the Alhambra shows the love of water in Islamic palaces. Uh, I've showed you uh, uh, one before, one court before with a beautiful pool in it. But where did they get the idea of domes like this? Solid structure reduced to uh, something that looks almost weightless. You've seen the Mukarnas uh, in various other places, and this seems to take the idea of turning a solid wall into a honeycomb or stalactites uh, to an absolute extreme. But no drawings exist, no descriptions of the process of building, no uh, accounts of its building. So we just have to look at it and marvel uh, at the amazing effect, transitions from one space to another and so on. The hall of the uh, two sisters, uh, which you see here, uh, is almost uh, immaterial. 
um, here's an entrance to the a portal at the entrance to the palace part of it, of course, well inside the walls, which again shows that love of water. So the lightness uh, and insubstantiality of the architecture reflected in the water creates quite a magic. Also within the walls of the Alhambra is the Generalife Palace with beautiful gardens, this long court with fountains playing into the water. Uh, oh. Oh. This is a, a really um, extraordinary and unforgettable place, but please don't ask me how it got to be that way because nobody knows. Human in that imagination wins over everything else. Well, now we will move to Isfahan in Persia. Here is a portrait of Shah Abbas, who reigned from 1587 to 1649, receiving a delegation of Uzbeks in, on the wall of a palace. He's here, he's an elegant young man with a fine mustache. He was a strong and fearsome character, but also deeply sensitive uh, to art, um, very, very pious. He made a long pilgrimage barefoot, I forget from where to where. But he's especially known for the city planning uh, of Isfahan. He actually moved the capital of his realm from uh, to Isfahan uh, and laid out this great square, the Maidan. You know, the, the Tahrir Square was the Maidan uh, of Cairo. Uh, so it's the main square of the town. At this end of it, at the lower end, uh, you can see the Shah Mosque built by uh, uh, by Shah Abbas. And you may wonder why it's skewed like that, but of course, city planning gave the Maidan one particular axis, uh, but the Qibla direction to Mecca uh, required another. So the mosque is in two parts, a sort of front wall facing the Maidan and the prayer hall behind. And you will note the beautiful blue dome tiled with abstract patterns. We'll get closer to it. So here's a view from the Midan uh, before it was fixed up quite as much as it is now uh, with the Shah Mosque. There on the left, you can see uh, the portal to the mosque, a large avan, two minarets, and then you turn towards Mecca and you come to another Ivan with two minarets uh, with the shimmering dome behind it. On the right is a palace built by Shah Abbas. It was an old palace, but, palace, but he remodeled it considerably. And its main feature is this high uh, columned space that looks out over the city. And when I stood there, I just couldn't Imagine what it'd be like on a hot night in summer for the Shah to be sitting there with his favorite people uh, eating sherbet. <laughs> so here is the Shah Mosque uh, seen through uh, an arch. And as we get closer, uh, we'll see that vast Awan in a absolutely flat wall, and then smaller ones uh, in the walls on either side. But the decoration with blue tiles, with abstract designs, floral designs, and calligraphy is extraordinary. Uh, here is the interior dome, rich in color, but without sculpture and Think of all those Italian churches with uh, all kinds of 
ways of breaking the, the, the surface uh, in expressive ways. So the architecture produced in the time of Shah Abbas uh, has an incredible richness to it. How they built something like this, I'm sure people would say, well, it would be impossible to build something like this before you could, before the invention of computer graphics. But they did it. One of the most beautiful buildings in Isfahan, um, the Madrasa uh, Theological College, was actually built in the 18th century, but you can see uh, that the architectural style established by Shah Abbas continues. There is that first Mukhanas that we showed us, but below it you can uh, make out uh, the doorway. I remember standing there when it was about 125 degrees in the shade, and just looking up at this Mukhanas, I thought, this is so beautiful that I don't feel the heat anymore. As you go through, you look up at this shallow dome and then come into a courtyard and the temperature seemed to drop at least 20 degrees just being in this place with its trees and its water. There's a close-up uh, of the dome and you can just make out the abstract patterns based on plant forms. It could even, uh, those forms could even inspire artists in the arts and crafts movement who love to use uh, natural forms. I was lucky enough to, I was there before the revolution and I was invited to climb the minaret and look out over the whole city. At this point I ran out of film, uh, so uh, I was a bit disappointed, but look at the close view of the mosque. There again is the Ali Kapu Palace, which we saw before. And you notice that all the way along the side of the Medan are commercial uh, spaces. Uh, Shah Abbas wanted to uh, invite craftsmen uh, I mean, uh, commercial activities into the square. It's sort of like the Rue de Rivoli in Paris, great architecture providing for small shops. Another view uh, of the Ali Kapu Palace. And there's another palace uh, with immense uh, high columns. It's known as the Chihil Sotun Palace, which means the palace of 40 columns. On the right is an amazing bridge across the river and underneath it uh, is a way that you can walk through in the shade. When I was there I saw lots of people reclining in the shade and cooling themselves with the river running underneath. Well now, for a complete change. You think you know what the principles of Islamic architecture, but here we are in Xi'an. Most people go to Xi'an uh, to see the terracotta army. Some go to the mosque, uh, and of course, it's completely Chinese. Uh, you would think that this is just a corner of the imperial palace or, or something like that. Uh, and the prayer hall uh, could be uh, a Chinese temple. The garden is full of beautiful little pavilions. Well, are there Islamic qualities in this? Succession of spaces, moving through a building, through openings, and finding uh, new places revealed behind. It's um, very different on the surface, uh, but I think that if you really analyzed it, you'd find that there are Islamic elements as well. Well, that is the completion of my first half. I'm gonna be talking about the evolution of structural design in Ottoman mosques, issues of monumentality and human scale, which uh, 
is something that's important to me. And then I will, uh, and the social complexes around the mosques, known as Culiers, and finally the architecture of Mimar Sinan. Let's see. <laughs> the domed mosques of Istanbul on the skyline above the Golden Horn stand in the most, as the most visible and enduring heritage of the Ottoman Empire. This romantic painting of 1873 by Ernst Kuhner shows how they dominate the city skyline and proclaim the glory of the sultans who built them. With their dramatic exterior forms, these architectural masterpieces express the promise of their soaring exterior spaces. <clears throat> the prayer halls, richly ornamented with exquisite colorful tiles and painted decoration, show that those who endured them spared no, who, sorry, endowed them spared <coughs> no expense for the glory of God. The architects of the mosques followed old traditions, but frequently displayed originality and engineering virtuosity as they pushed the boundaries of structure, space, and light. At first sight, we may be most impressed by the sheer size of Ottoman mosques. They compete with the great churches of Christendom as they rise high above surrounding townscape. However, they differ from the churches of Rome, Paris, and the western cities in the manner of their integration, both physically and socially with the urban fabric. Architects of the European Renaissance and Baroque eras obsessed with the principles of classical Rome and striving to produce ideal forms forms aimed to place buildings with dominant front facades on the focal points of major axes in their city's plans. This engraving by Piranesi of St. Peter's Rome approached through the Grand Piazza designed by Gian Lorenzo Bernini in 1656. In contrast, the mosques of Istanbul and other cities of the empire are subtly integrated into the terrain in which they stand and with the neighborhoods they serve. I will suggest that despite their grandeur, they possess a sense of human scale. You can see that the principal door on the main axis of the mosque uh, on the right does not line up with a street. The Sulemanye complex despite its vast size, was designed to relate in a comfortable manner to worshippers who approached them and to the members of the nearby community who use uh, associated buildings. While they elicit a sense of, uh, of awe, they can also be welcoming to ordinary people. It's important to understand that Ottoman mosques, whether endowed by sultans, their widows, or grand viziers, were set in complexes of buildings known as couliers that served the residents of the areas around them. Their patrons often envisioned them as nuclei of new urban neighborhoods in which both, in which both spiritual and practical needs would be met. They te typically included public baths, schools, libraries, hospitals, and accommodation for travelers, and kitchens to feed students and the poor. The creation of Kuliers is rooted in one of the five pillars of Islam, zakat, the obligation of Muslims to offer charity. In the landscape of today, as when they were new, they mediate between the surrounding domestic buildings and the grand structure of the mosque. The dynasty of sultans founded by Osman I around 1258 to 1326 appears in this family true with Osman on the trunk and his descendants proudly above. They ruled over an empire that at its peak in the 17th century 
stretched eastwards from the Balkans, through the Middle East to the shores of the Caspian Sea, south to the Persian Gulf, and west along the coast of North Africa to, enjoy, to include Egypt and Algeria. The Ottomans began in the 13th century as just one of the tribes filling the vacuum left by the decline of the Seljuks and the Mongols. Osman I dedicated himself to spreading Islam while conquering Byzantine territory. Ottoman success rested on skill at forming alliances and negotiating supreme power in a multicultural and multi-ethnic state. The birth and early progress of the caliphate is, he founded is revealed partly through the mosques built by the leaders in their three capitals. And the three capitals are Bursa, Edirne, and Istanbul. Istanbul is the only city in the world divided between two continents, Europe and Asia. My wife and I enjoyed living in both parts. After Selim I conquered Egypt, Syria, and Arabia in 1517, he assumed the caliphate and thus became the guardian of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. The role of caliph greatly enhanced the prestige of the sultans who succeeded him. The empire gradually declined during the 18th and 19th centuries and came to an end when the last sultan was sent into exile in 1922. The evolution of the Ottoman mosque can, we, can be traced back to examples in the first two capitals of the empire, Bursa and Edine, Edirne, captured from the Byzantines in 1326 and 1361, respectively. The first three, in the first three centuries, they evolved from one small square cell covered with a single dome, or as in the case of what you see now, to twin dome structures, and gradually as more domes were added to one vast prayer hall with a central dome surrounded by smaller ones. I will quickly show you the evolution. Mosques were mostly built of stone, sometimes combined with brick, for the polychrome effect, perhaps, and in the absence of tall trees for construction of wide span roofs, they were covered with masonry domes, protected from the weather with lead sheeting. These enduring materials gave them the potential of long life. Being nomadic in origin, the Ottomans possessed no architectural tradition of any permanence. They acquired their vocabulary uh, like their predecessors elsewhere, primarily from existing structures in the land they conquered, and may well have pressed Byzantine builders into service for the construction of their first mosques. The architects designed according to sound principles, rather than reducing structures to a skeleton of stone like the master masons of Gothic cathedrals in Northern Europe, they made sure that supporting piers, arches and buttresses, as well as crowning domes, were strong enough to resist earthquakes. Indeed, their seismic resistance has been demonstrated over the years, with few exceptions. Over the centuries, and most recently, in the most severe earthquake of 1999, whose aftermath we witnessed. As you will see in the sequence I'll show you, the architects were innovative and progressive, producing dominating domes spanning wide prior halls. But these did not appear in the mosques of the 14th and early 15th century. Typically, interiors were covered with several small domes. Here is one. This is the mosque built in Bursa by Orhan Ghazi, the son of Osman, consisting of four domed compartments arranged so that three of them open up a central prayer hall. The space defined by four walls is surmounted by an octagonal stage and a circular dome. The transition from square to circular is made by squinches, arches across the corners. These squinches are ornamented in a pattern that resembles origami, a type of structure that you'll see again in another mosque 
Uh, it's a bit difficult to make out. Uh, here is a squinch across a corner, and this is this amazing uh, three-dimensional geometric effect below. The Yashil Jami, the green mosque of 1412, built by Orhan's son and grandson, also has two main domes. But this time the prayer hall expands into spaces under smaller domes on either side. If you look up at the interior photo, you will see a unique design element with the appearance again of origami, known as the Turkish Band of Triangles. Sounds like the title of a story by Conan Doyle. Um, it began a decorative and symbolic tradition that was to flourish with glorious, colorful tiles, particularly in the 16th century. You can just make out the green tiles a little dark on the left. The Ulu Jami, the great mosque in Bursa, built by Bezid I in 1396, expands that complex that concept dramatically. 20 domes cover the prayer hall. The story goes that Bezid, about to march into battle at Nicopolis against crusaders, made a promise to God that if he won, he would build 20 mosques. This sultan, known as Yildirim, meaning thunderbolt, gained the title because of the speed with which he moved his troops. A wise imam suggested that his military triumph that after his military triumph, that one mosque with 20 domes would suffice. His acceptance of the scaled-down plan at least meant that his project could be finished before he was taken prisoner by Tumur and died in captivity. The Uligat Jami's domes, supported on massive piers, appear less dominant in the broad space than the piers with Kufic calligraphy on their surfaces. The eight small windows in each of the domes create pools of light uh, under each bay. The experience of walking through the space is magical, but quite unlike entering one of the later mosques covered with a single large dome. The Uch Sherefeli Jam Jami in Bursa 1438 is the first mosque in which one dome dom dom dominates. Built in Edirne by Murat III, it stands as the pivotal structure in the path from the early architecture of Bursa to the post-conquest mosques in Istanbul with their dominant domes. The name Uch Sherefeli simply refers to the three balconies on one of the minarets. More significant is the first introduction of the Avlu, the courtyard which became an essential feature uh, of the major mosque that follows. This open air space, similar to a medieval cloister and shady arcaded walks around it, offered a peaceful transition from the commotion of the streets outside uh, the prayer hall. The principal breakthrough in this design is the creation of one dome twice as large as those on either side of it, thus expanding the interior space far beyond that of any earlier mosque. See in the plan, here is the main dome, the two little ones on either side, and this diagram, which we will see expanding uh, in the future, um, shows that pattern of a main dome and two small domes. The yellow diagram emphasizes the arrangement. This is one of the two main domes exquisitely designed with, sorry, with, I lose my place if I use the pointer. Um, this is one of the two side domes exquisitely designed with squinches between the square walls below and the dome. The painted ornament is mostly inspired by plant forms with calligraphy proclaiming a verse from the Quran adorning the blue ring. 
Surprisingly, the whole interior can be seen from one viewpoint. The dividing piers, though massive, have been reduced to two in number. But we will shortly witness how, in only 16 years, the design of prayer halls is vastly uh, changed. So, in 1453, Mehmet II, known as Fatih the Conqueror, conquered Constantinople. Mehmet claimed, claimed the great Byzantine cathedral of Hagia Sophia, built by the Byzantine emperor between 532 and 537. But he allowed Christians to, work in, to worship in several other churches. On the very day that Mehmet entered the city, he wrote to Hagia Sophia to claim the symbolic prize. The court historian Torsenbeg described Mehmet's return to the church the following day with a group of learned men and his astonishment at the splendor of the dome that competes with the domes of the heaven. Admiring the floor of colored marbin and the marble and the dome covered with tiny colorful pieces of glass and golden rock crystals, Torsen wrote, when one looks from the floor to its ceiling, he sees the, the sky filled with stars. And when one looks from the ceiling to the floor, he sees seas with dashing waves. After he observed the interesting and strange images inside the cathedral, Mehmet, the sultan of the universe, quote, climbed to the dome as the spirit of God mounted to the fourth story of the heavens. As he gazed at Constantinople from the top of this architectural masterpiece, the words of the prophet Muhammad must have echoed through his head. They will conquer Constantinople. Hail, hail, hail to the prince and the army to whom this is granted. He also described how when he was looking up at the underneath side of the dome, he saw the great Christ in majesty, which is no longer there, and all in mosaic. And he described how the eyes of Jesus followed him as he moved around the room. Hagia Sophia is centralized under a huge dome, supported on four arches, but the space space beneath it is elongated by the addition of two half, half domes covering apses. So it combines the attributes of the circular Roman pantheon and a rectangular basilica. Unlike the pantheon, which was only lit through a single circular oculus in the crown of the dome, Hagia Sophia received daylight through a ring of windows at the base of the dome and myriad other sources. The Roman historian Procopius wrote that the dome does not appear to rest on a solid foundation, but to be su suspended from heaven by the fabled golden chain. Within upper surfaces, with upper surfaces covered with mosaics and lower walls and structural piers faced with elaborate veined marble, the interior space appeared at the time of the conquest, even more rich and mysterious, mysterious than it does today. These images show the spatial organization that inspire Ottoman architects to continue the evolution of structure and space that began in Bursa and continued in Istanbul. The first Ottoman mosques after the conquest uh, was built by Mehmet II, the conqueror. Although he added a minaret to Hagia Sophia and converted it to a mosque, he soon embarked on the construction of his own imperial mosque. He was determined to go beyond the Ucherefeli design. His architects took a step towards Hagia Sophia by adding a half dome above the Quiquibla wall, but not at the opposite end. The distagram compares it with its forerunner. An earthquake destroyed this mosque, one of the few to fall. The, the Fatih complex uh, can be seen, the replacement one can be seen 
from the air today, roughly in the same position, and the position of the coulier uh, with libraries, baths, kitchens, etc., uh, around it. And it's believed that this rather formal design was actually influenced by the Italian architect Filaretti. The imperial mosque built by Mehmet the the first son, sorry, Mehmet the second son, Bezid II in 1501, survives and shows a continuation of the same tradition, as well as the influence of Hagia Sophia. The prayer hall embodies the spatial scene, the scheme of the Byzantine cathedral, with a vast central dome and an elongation by the addition of half domes at both ends. As, and you will see the progression in this diagram here. The architect of the Bezit Mosque, rather than imitating Hagia Sophia, transformed the character of its interior. With great engineering skill, he reduced the volume of the piers and, the, and then eliminated the barrier between nave and aisles. This is the first imperial mosque with a lofty interior flooded with light and surrounded by visually connected interior spaces. As in Hagia Sophia, rings of windows penetrate the base of the main dome, and the half domes and vertical walls at either end contain many more windows. Then I come to the 16th century architect, Mimar Sinan, who held the post of chief architect for Suleiman the Magnificent and two sultans who succeeded him over a period of 50 years until his death in 1588. He inherited the Ottoman architectural tradition, uh, but he absorbed both the vocabulary uh, of Muslim buildings and the Byzantine construction uh, Muslim geometric order. Having trained and worked for many years as an engineer in the Janissary Corps, he understood the necessity of using durable materials and sound structural principles. In his long tenure as chief architect, during which he held responsibility for over a hundred domed mosques, he experimented boldly with structure, space, and light. Although he Initially followed the Byzantine scheme of placing domes on four piers and arches. He varied the structural system and carried domes aloft on four, six, or eight supporting arches. Sinan's outstanding design demonstrates the power of his structural analysis and artistic vision. There is no question that Sinan's 16th century mosques represent a high point of Ottoman architecture. Sinan's first mosque, the Shezada Jami, shows a further step in the evolution of Ottoman architecture. It was built in memory of Suleiman's son, the Shezada, meaning crown pence, Mehmet, who died of smallpox. Suleiman, who heard the news when he returned from a victorial, victorious campaign, mourned beside the coffin for three days, and then commanded his chief architect to build a worthy mosque in his honor. He rose to the occasion with a superb design. The Bezit, Bezit the second mosque had come close, close to the structure or structural organization of Hagia Sophia uh, with a central dome uh, and two half domes. But but Sinan went further, the support system with half domes on two sides and vertical walls and buttresses on the other side had created problems at Hagia Sophia, necessitating the strengthening of the buttresses. It seemed to Sinan that the, local, that the logical so solution to this asymmetry was to surround the central dome with four half domes thus equalizing the structural forces in four directions. Here is my final yellow diagram uh, showing uh, the journey from Utschirefeli to Mehmet II, Bezit I, and finally to the Shezada Mosque, which adds uh, a full four half domes. Here is the dome which crowns the prayer hall 
Four equal arches support it. A ring of windows floods the space with copious light. As you'll see shortly, many more openings penetrate the walls all the way to the floor. But how did he support the weight of a dome without pushing the columns over and making the walls collapse? The solution is to place what he called weight towers uh, over the arches. And I think you may be able to make them out. Oh. Oh, what's happened? OK. These are the weight flowers. These cylinders of solid stone stand right over these piers uh, carrying the arches. I think we'll see them better in another example later on. But this is like the pinnacle on a flying buttress in uh, a Gothic cathedral. They act as counterweights. They stand, they stand between the half domes. This design not only produced a totally centralized interior space, but allowed the architect to open up the walls to light in an unprecedented manner. He was also able to eliminate the need for intermediate columns and arches between the piers. Thus, Sinan was able to make a spacious, luminous prayer hall. He handled the scale in a subtle manner, making a gradual transition from the dome to the floor. The weight of the dome is distributed between a multitude of structural members. There's a progression from the four largest arches supporting the dome to 12 arches below and twice as many on the next level down. The interior model, the interior arrangement is not disguised by an applied facade, but is clearly expressed in the, ex in the exterior walls. One design characteristic that is strikingly different from Christian churches is that the windows are close to the floor, giving worshippers a connection with the outside. In both Gothic and Renaissance churches, lower walls are usually lined with altars and works of art and tombs, leaving the windows high above eye level. Even in grand 16th century mosques, busks, the low sills contribute to the sense of human scale. The beautifully crafted wooden shutters opening the deep reveals of the windows create an almost domestic character. The sills provide seats or serve as places for copies of the Quran. Finally, let's look at the exterior of the Shazada Mosque. Unlike many Italian Renaissance churches with applied facades that barely reflect the interior, this wall of Sinan's mosque that faces the street reveals the character of the prayer hall by the disposition of the windows. I offer a comparison with Andrea Pallado, Palladio's Church of San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice, which shows an obsession with the revival of Roman architecture. I loved the work of Palladio, but having been educated as an architect, as a modernist, I see Sinan's design, in Sinan's design, form following function. When Sinan designed the ambitious Sulimanie, Coulier and Mosque, he cleared a large site where an old palace that housed elderly women from the Sultan's harem stood among terraced gardens. He leveled the site by moving thousands of ox carts of soil to create a broad platform on which the mosque stands. You can imagine that the garden terrace on the side of the mosque facing the waterway offers a magnificent view. Few people ever bother to go there, but it's one of my favorite places. On the other side, the general layout is rec rectilinear. The surrounding buildings of the Coulier, covered by many small domes, arranged in a rectangle. But he did not create an axial post approach to either of the entrances. I showed you the, this one before, but I'll make uh, the point again. It's not aligned with the street. The mosque is symmetrical, but the whole complex is not. You'll see how the gardens on either side are planted informally with grass and trees. Worshippers mostly enter the street from one, uh, through one small gate and pass through a garden informally planted with grass and trees. 
So rather than a vast portal approached by a flight of steps, we enter this simple gate. This precinct of the mosque, not through giant portals up a grand flight of steps, but through small gates at a wall. From this, they approach obliquely through an informally planted garden. Uh, you pass along the side uh, of the mosque uh, with, with arcades in front of it that actually disguise the vast buttresses that shored up the dome. So there is a feeling of human scale. And along the bottom of that wall, there are taps and little marble seats that people can sit on. And I've always noticed when I've been through families and groups of women and families relaxing and picnicking on the grass. From this green space, we turn to the right and right again into the courtyard. The arcades around it soften the impact of the vast structure. They offer shade and a chance to see beautiful calligraphy on tiled plaques over the windows. Looking up at the dome above, we can see one of the half domes billowing out towards us and on either side of it, two massive octagonal weight towers. I think you could see the weight towers more... E oh. Oh. You can see the weight towers more easily on this one. Thousands of tons of stone keeping the columns in place. And then finally, we enter the overwhelming prayer hall. Our first uh, response is to gaze, gaze upwards, where hundreds of tons of stone appear weightless. It seems inappropriate to dwell on technical aspects of engineering when the natural response is emotional. Sudan has dematerialized the architectural structure and liberated the space. Columns are slender. Polychrome arches soar ab above our heads. The Mukhanas design, upper right, transforms a solid pendentive into a honeycomb. You'll notice that windows go right down to the floor. Guru Nejipulu, in her book, The Age of Sinan, wrote about the reaction of the 16th century essayist Evilia Celebi on the phenomenon. The spatial continuity between the interior and the exterior is particularly strong in this tripartite Qibla wall. The floral Islic, Islic times, tiles and stained glass windows create an illusion of transparency, as if the garden were visible, uh, wait a minute, as if the, the funerary garden visible from the ground floor windows is continuous with the mosque interior. According to Evelia, the odors of flowers fill the prayer hall from the open windows, perfuming the minds of the congregation as if they had entered heaven. The longitudinal axis that begins at the monumental uh, north portal of the forecourt and passes through the main gate culminates in the mirab with an earthly vision of paradise. Suleiman I, a sensitive man who supported scholarship and education, wanted the Kulye to become the intellectual center of Istanbul. Today, it serves many purposes. It houses an important library of rare books and educational facilities. The hospital is currently being re restored, and many buildings along the street facing the mosque serve as cafes and souvenir shops. Here, it, there is a tea garden in a sunken courtyard. And the Imaret, the, oh, I, you should have been looking at this one before uh, with people feeling they're in paradise as they smell the perfume of the flowers. Sorry about that. Um, and here is the Imaret. Oh, outside um, there's a street uh, between some of the buildings of the Coulier and the mosque, uh, which are cafes and shops. And then this is the Imaret, the kitchen that fed multitudes in the 16th and 17th century, is now 
a fine restaurant that serves Turkish specialities. Don't miss it when you go to Istanbul. Down the hill, ooh. down the hill to the Eminönü waterfront, you see a dome, which seems to be raised up uh, above a lower structure. This is the mosque of Rustem Pasha, who was a very mercenary character, and he liked the idea of having rentable space below it. You approach it uh, through a market, uh, and from the place where goods are displayed for sale, you can look up and see arches leading into the forecourt of the mosque under a sheltering canopy and look down through those arches to the right into the market or you can turn left and see the incredible walls of Iznik tiles. Uh, Rustam Pasha himself uh, actually did a lot of work uh, supporting the supporting the Iznik tile works and he really shows them off inside his church. The dome resting not on four supports and arches but on eight uh, appears much lighter. The little arches sort of dance around the, pr the prayer hall and the walls are covered uh, with these rich blue tiles and a marvelous calligraphy. And if you're familiar with the collection of the Asian Art Museum, you may have seen these two plates on the right, which almost reflect patterns in the mirab. And in some areas, the floral uh, designs on the tiles are really absolutely amazing. Just I'm going to briefly touch on one small mosque. Uh, this is actually the view from our apartment uh, window when we lived on the Asian side. It was, uh, it was built by uh, the widow of a sultan and it contains a huge coulier with many, many facilities, including a hospital, and that is used as a mental hospital today. I'll only show you this one picture of it, which shows the community consisting mainly of old men sitting in the courtyard. Uh, it's all to a deliciously human scale. And you can look across past the ablutions fountain to the dome. And finally, we come to the Selimie Mosque in Edirne. Selim the second was the was a son of Suleiman, uh, but not his favorite son. His favorite Mehmet was accused in a plot by Selim's mother and Rustem Pasha, who was a wily and evil character, to convince Suleiman that he was going to plot his overthrow. And so he in a characteristic, characteristically Ottoman manner uh, was dispatched. And Selim, uh, who was regarded, who was named Selim the Sot, who didn't quite live up to the va value of Mustafa, um, was the patron, uh, was the next sultan and the patron of this uh, mosque. It seems a bit ironic uh, that the finest of all Sinan's mosque commemorated the least of the patrons. As you look at this, you can see the dynamic structure. It, I compare it here uh, with Burj, Burj Cathedral with its flying buttresses, uh, though there's certainly an exaggeration of dynamism in the Gothic example. 
As we approach it, it's absolutely vast. We can actually enter that gate and go through a bazaar, an underground bazaar, and come up in the cathedral, in, in the mosque grounds. Or we can walk up a street, go through a simple archway and into the courtyard of the mosque, which, like others, uh, is a wonderful, quiet place and where there's details to be enjoyed, such as the calligraphy over the windows or this beautiful scallop dome over the entry door. Standing in the courtyard, looking up at the mosque, somehow it's been reduced in scale to something that we can handle. Uh, we enter through the door and we come into this soaring space with eight arches supporting eight, uh, eight, sorry, eight piers supporting eight arches. And then we come up to the dome. Structure seems to have been eliminated. Think of the Pantheon, think of Hagia Sophia. Uh, this is all light and spiritual uh, admiration. So that is the sequence uh, from the early mosques uh, of Bursa uh, to the final high point of Sinan's career in Istanbul. So thank you.